All right. Cool. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, to show up and talk about uh, hybrid custody. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been a subject of really awesome discussion. Um, so thank you to to everyone who's who's pitched into the forum, proposed into the flip. Uh, I, I even saw Austin. You guys, uh, you, a couple of you actually collaborated on a like an alternative standard. So um, that's really appreciated to have something that's like you know concrete that we can we can kind of uh, look to. Um, and, uh, and so basically today, uh, just to start off with like what we're looking for, um, is, is basically in, in alignment on the account access model, um, basically came out with a flip for anyone who's not fully caught up on, on like the forum post and the proposal that's, that's been posted there, um, came out with a flip originally, which would give application and users unrestricted access on this like hybrid custody account. Um, which the, the application would set up in the process of like walletlessly onboarding a user. Um, problem there being that you have two parties that have access to, to an account and well now someone else is liable for the, the other party doing some like nefarious um, uh, activities with like financial instruments basically. And so, okay, well in that case, uh, we spoke with some counsel and wanted to get to the crux of the issue and the crux of that issue is is pretty much control and or access to either the account or like the the instruments in question, the financial financial instruments in question, which I guess in our world would just be like fungible tokens primarily. Um, so there are two options there in terms of you know giving builders the ability to protect themselves from that being the case. One is okay, well, I know what I need. I'll just go ahead and give myself access to the things that I need. And uh, the user can have unrestricted access in the account and me as the application developer i can i can restrict my access to just the nfts or whatever other resources i may need access to um, and then i can continue to act on behalf of the user while the user has um uh, have has access to this account can have can have the real ownership that we're after with with hybrid custody the alternative and pretty much all the feedback that we've gotten about uh that proposal is is, is pretty much grounded in the idea that, well, we want to remove a complexity away for these application developers, which we're dependent on to make hybrid custody a thing in the first place. And so, well, let's just go ahead and give the user restricted access and then the application developers can, you know, manage custody and manage the accounts um, in whatever manner they need to. Um, and they'll still have those guarantees that, well, nothing that I don't want to be in this account uh, will end up in this account. Um, so I think there's some nuance around each of those those components and each of those approaches. Uh, I guess before I get started, really, what we're looking for in this conversation is is alignment on which account model uh, should we proceed with, um, and that is primarily because the flip for that linked account standard is is basically blocked by this account model. Um, before before I jump into that, I think it's important to couch like this conversation and one, what is hybrid custody and like what are the product requirements we're after for this? And, and primarily from a user perspective, because I think that's, I mean, being like obsessed with that user experience is something that's generally missing from our industry. And I think we're all we're all in agreement about that because we're working on flow and we're, we're pretty well focused on that. Um, and, um, and then also like wherever that, our solution puts complexity, asking ourselves, where is the room for further abstraction from uh, for, on that complexity? Um, so real quick, uh, I wanna make plenty of time for discussion, but um, go ahead and make this larger. Um, so the product requirements for hybrid custody really are, we want to give users ownership over the assets that are inside of these uh, shared access accounts, right? I go to some app, there's an NFT or some game resource or whatever the resource may be that I want access to um, and I want ownership of. Once my account, link my account, I should have access to those things. Um, that kind of Im implicitly gives us composability across the ecosystem and the user can basically use that, that NFT, for example, in another use case that like builds utility or gives that NFT new utility. Um, access to linked accounts should be portable. So if I link an account and I go into a place like Floaty, for example, Floaty should be able to see all of my linked accounts and the things that I have access to in them. Um, should be easily interpretable by both apps and wallets um, so people know how to actually leverage these, these things. And 
of course, we have to make sure that developers can maintain regulatory compliance with whatever approach we choose. And of course, the crux being control and access to those financial instruments. Um, and that kind of points to, again, the whole point we're here, the whole reason we're here is the guarantees limited access on either party. So which party are we gonna choose? Uh, what's what's gonna be best for everyone involved? Um, and so, uh, actually I think, I think Austin uh, really, really put it well. And basically we're like, look, we're trying to bootstrap this um, this this network of hybrid custody applications, we're reliant on application developers to actually enable this in their applications, where you know maybe they don't necessarily have an incentive to do so. Adding complexity is only going to increase the barrier uh, to their adoption of this. Um, and so, uh, I, I guess that's really all the context that I wanted to to give to this. Um, Jerome, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I also, you know, you and me were having this very chat on Friday on last week about how complex this has got and my concerns over the complexities because, you know, complexity equals problems, right? And it's just a lot of cognitive stuff to take, your, take on. So I can see why the discussion's ending up the way it is. I mean, just to kind of get right back to what originally motivated this, just so we remember the, there's, because there's also been a kind of, um, I guess, it's been, in, it's kind of been inferred or the takeaway from this has been a little bit, sort of that, you know, people are looking to this as perhaps more than, you know, it's it's got a, its specific use cases, I guess, is the point. We originally were thinking of the, the reason why the account linking and therefore hybrid custody wanted to exist on Flow and could, and we realized it could exist, but the reason why was on mobile, when you're having a mobile experience, it's a real deal breaker when you have to switch between two different apps, you go from your, your game app to your wallet app to approve a transaction back to your game app and, and back and forth. And the whole back and forth, that whole first time user experience, the idea was if on mobile you could just sign one transaction that basically imparted some fundamental ability for the DAP to be able to carry out some actions on your behalf through, you know, some, you know, and through, or at least operate on some NFTs. And so that, that idea of making that first user experience on mobile way, way low in transaction modals and dialogues, especially anything that leaves the actual main app that you're using was kind of the real original motivation for this. Because in every other context, like on web, people are completely used to this stuff. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense necessarily. And you, and hybrid custody may not make sense for some applications, may not make as much sense for web as it does for mobile. And so that's kind of the original seed idea that kind of set us down this path of like, what can we do to eliminate those modals in a, mo in a mobile setting where you simply don't have, you know, like the same technology as web where you have those plugins and modals in, the, in your view right, right there. So, so that's the other, I've only final little piece of context I wanted to add in there because it's not, this is not like a, it's not a panacea solution. Like it's not something that we, you know, we'll have to be very careful whatever we come out with at the end for the final standard. It's going to have to be couched in, in it's really useful in these use cases and for these scenarios, but not necessarily for a bunch of other things. Um, it's it's you know it's one of those things we have to remember. It's it's got it's purpose built for certain things. We I would say. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's the thing. I mean it's like it's 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 not like you're you've signed it already, right? You've signed the capability for a capability so to be able to do something like you know like. Yeah, so anyway, but that's that's a whole that, that's kind of the original use case. But now we're in the hybrid custody part, so we're talking about how we would design it and how that might work. And you know, I don't know how connected it is to the original idea of what we were doing, but I think the idea of hybrid custody is very interesting, and so I think it's worth exploring. But you know, it's one of the things where you know the journey has been very dynamic. It's not like we set out to build hybrid custody in the way it looks right now. It's kind of been more like what, what, there was a problem we wanted to solve in the beginning. Um, and, you know, we don't talk about that much anymore, but that's kind of where it started. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to build on um, what Yarte pointed out, like the, um, the, the the security model here, I guess, is basically that you're taking on, you're understanding that there's like, uh, maybe the user wouldn't necessarily understand this, but the security model would be, I have this partitioning basically where the, the application can't access any of the stuff that's in my main account. But... Um, anything that's related to the app, the application will have access to. Um, and so I guess that's that's where the, the, the bit of security comes in. Um, let's go ahead and go to hands. Uh, Austin? 
Yeah, I, I guess I've heard it mentioned a few times this like we should choose which model we want to use, but they both have their own distinct purposes and, and um, satisfy different requirements. Like I see Giovanni, your your version of what was put out um, really to be more akin to like hot wallet and cold wallet is kind of what I think about it as where, um, you know, I, I'll delegate access to some things to access, you know, maybe I want to mint through some other wallet, but not through mine. And that's the kind of model that I want. Uh, and other models make sense for other things. So I don't think that we have to choose one or the other here. I, I think it, to, to Jerome's point, like really honing in on who the problem is being solved for and then working backwards from there to the right solution, which is why I spent the weekend trying to give an alternative um, it is because they're different. Um, and because I think that, uh, you know, one is better at solving one of those problems and the other is better at solving, uh, at least in my view, a different version of it as well. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I guess I had I, I had kind of placed this in an either or. Uh, and I guess pri primarily because, um, well, I think in order for it to be, make sense to a user, um, like what this, like introducing two notions of linked accounts into the ecosystem feels like that's, I mean, given the complexity of uh, of how things have gone at least so far, um, uh, could could add kind of a, a undue like uh, cognitive load. Um, but uh, th like this idea, I guess without getting to the level the the implementation details, like the way that I envision this is, uh, I as a user, I have a bunch of different applications, and without hybrid custody, I basically have to manage. Uh, all of the assets within those applications per application and it's limited in scope, I have a wallet card in. With linked accounts, uh, with hybrid custody, I'm able to, to link those accounts. And now I go into my wallet and I see all of those resources, those NFTs, just I guess in, in, in our case, uh, as if they were in the top level account. Uh, and I can manage um, each of those, uh, those NFTs um, either you know send them to a buddy or list them or get notifications about their offers just through my through my primary wallet um, and the 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 difficulty that I've had wrapping my head around is okay if we if we're going to go ahead and put restrictions on users that's ultimately going to be up to each application and each application might define those differently and so when I go back to my wallet um, how does how does my wallet know let alone like a marketplace know how to engage with each of those collections, given that my the access for each of those might differ and not apply to you know the public private capabilities that are standard for the NFTs. Um, that's, that's, I guess, been my primary uh, concern around putting restrictions on the users is that it could fragment that user experience um, and make it more complicated for them to do interesting things with hybrid custody. Um, I, and I, I, I'm definitely, I, I can, I can see how the other concern on the other side of things would be, well, if we make it too complex then hybrid custody won't exist. Um, so just trying to figure out, is there room for abstraction of that complexity? Um, we're going to be putting that on the, putting that burden on the application developers. Um, uh, go ahead, Eric. Hi. Um, so I just like to give some context on the the, the backstory for this and um, how Dapper is is hoping to leverage this. So first of all, accounts on Flow are extremely cheap to create and maintain. And the original reasoning for this particular flip, or I guess at least my interpreted um, purpose was we want frictionless, wallet-less onboarding, right? In a mobile context, this makes a lot of sense. And if you want to do that, where you are merely interacting with the backend of a server, you want to start with a Puppet account, not a Puppet collection, right? Because you want your stuff to be isolated in a single account. So at least, you know, when you backtrack the history of your NFTs, it makes a lot of sense, and these um, and that that 
to me sounds like the sole purpose of this thing, but it gets complex once you look into the the legal side of things uh, with regard to financial instruments, uh, restricting liability to the DAP, et cetera. Um, the problem with placing the restrictions on the on this puppet account or, or child account itself or um, adding in new security measures post um, claiming adoption is you can it's very hard to guarantee that this account is actually secure in the first place um, so here's a concrete example you start um, you register an account with with the app called the Flow Rider, right? It's like a game, and uh, they do you know wallet-less onboarding. They they instantiate a Flow account for you, so that every time you do a game, your progress is saved onto the game, and everything just looks great. And after a while, you know, you start to accumulate some valuable assets on that account, and then you want to claim that account for yourself so that you could maybe, say, sell some of those assets through your Blockto wallet or Lilico wallet. Um, and then you claim it, right? At this point, um, Flowrider, according to our proposal, uh, Flowrider is supposed to restrict their access. Their, their backend server is supposed to restrict their access to the account um, so that they limit their liability. Uh, but that's the sole purpose or reason for that move. There's nothing kind of preventing Lowrider from making a auth account link in the first place before you claimed it, right? Um, and they don't even necessarily have to expose that functionality. So when you, because right off the bat, that account is fully controlled by the Flowrider backend, they could potentially do a also account linking and then shovel it into the collection resource, which contract that they control, right? So down the line, sure, they could do restrictions so that they are limited to accessing your collection, the Flowrider collection only for this puppet account. But there could totally be a possibility that there is a also account capability stored in that collection where down the line they could revive it, right? So this backdoor still exists. So it's very hard for us to make guarantees to the user that this puppet account is safe to store other other assets without it being accessed by the DAP that created the account in the first place. And this is mostly why we're kind of only focusing on the legal liability side of things for the DAP and just trying to you know present the model to the to the user that this puppet account is not safe to store anything else than the assets that is related to this particular DAP. Um, yeah, so there's that. And uh, for DAPR side of things, um, we are hoping to leverage this model so that um, we can have co-custody of um, DAP assets with um, other wallets like um, uh, Blockto so that the, the end, uh, model or, or vision that we have is you have a MEA top shot puppet account. It has a parent that is Dapper, the Dapper custodial wallet. So you could engage in fiat like um, transactions, uh, PDP transactions with other users. This top shot puppet account also has a parent account that is Blockto or Lilico so that you can engage in outside of Dapper activities like you know, placing your NFT as, as a collateral for a loan offering for Floaty. So you could do both at the same time, like list the same assets on the top shop marketplace and list it on Floaty at the same time. And that's how Dapper is hoping to leverage this so that, you know, you don't have to go through Dapper's kind of transaction review process and et cetera. Um, 
we are willing to let external developers to access the top shot collection directly through the user's self custody wallet. Um, yeah, so that, that's most of the context that, that I have. So feel free to ask any questions if you have any. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, Dennis, I see your hand is up. Uh, I have one question, Eric. Uh, you said that like after linking the account, the DEP will somehow restrict its access. Uh, can you expand on this a little bit? How it will restrict or like uh, how the user experience will change there? Like for example, if I have like Puppet account on TopShot, I can without like using FCL, uh, without confirming any transactions, I will work on it. Like I will list my moments, everything will work. But then if I link my account to some like, let's say blocked account, if the top shot gets the gets their restrictions removed somehow, uh, access removed, then like for example, then I will need to confirm the transactions, how it will work. Okay, so this is somewhat orthogonal to each other. The, the potential security vulnerability that I, I explained was mostly just to kind of reason that this DAP account, this Puppet account created for the DAP's purpose should not be used to store anything else by the user because it's, it's hard to guarantee it is secure. But for the co-custody model, Dapper will not do something like that because we would like to maintain our reputation. And more importantly, we would like to maintain or limit our liability with regard to these accounts that now have another full control parent, right? So if a top shot account, a puppet account is linked to a Dapper account, and the block to account. The block to account could shovel some fungible token box into the into the puppet account, right? Yeah. Dapper doesn't like to have that liability, so Dapper is going to restrict the Dapper custodial wallet linking to the Topshot puppet account, so that it can only access the Topshot moment collection, and it cannot access anything else. Uh, so basically, this Blockto can only access the NFTs. Blockto would have full access to the Puppet account because it will be using the proper child account linking process where it has a auth account capability to the child account. But Dapper will not. Dapper will be using something that is wrapped on top of that auth account so that we would manually or purposely restrict our access to the puppet account. Ah, so like Depper will not have any more like the signing keys for the account or some kind of like old capability. You don't necessarily need the signing keys for the child account to make use of the collections that's stored in the child account. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead in here. Yeah, okay. So I think one thing I'm trying to understand is, is that a general statement, Eric, where you're saying, like, you don't think child accounts should hold anything other than things related to the app? Because the way I read a lot of this proposal was you're almost turning the child account into close, like, close to a full usage account, right? Like, it can, you can do pretty much anything to that child account after you've linked it. So I'm only kind of expressing my opinions from, from the perspective, side. right? Um, and I'm, this is a ongoing discussion and, and that would require kind of contributions from all over the, the ecosystem to, to, to help us to establish a better standard for this. So that point on whether the Puppet account is secure or not is, uh, mostly my opinion, I've discussed with some colleagues within the organization and they agree as well. Um, but that's 
is something that we can work. We can all, everyone in this call, everyone on, on working on Flow can work together to see what is if there's a better way to ensure this is secure. So here's an example. You could, you could, you know, before you, after you do the linking, you could check your private path, right? You could see if there's anything fishy in there. If there is already, if there's another auth awesome account capability linked out through your private path, you could wipe it out, right? So that the only thing linked out, you know what they are. So you could potentially determine that, okay, this account maybe is secure. Um, that could be one way to do it, right? Um, we are not trying to restrict or impose patterns on developers. Uh, that is not healthy for, for, for Flow at all. What we are trying to do is finding the bare minimum common interface for all of us to recognize and work on. So what that means is, so we've actually explored something similar to this a while ago, where um, we would kind of link a the capability for the specific resource collection to the Dapper prime, uh, custodial wallet. And um, then theoretically, it could just access it, right? I don't know if you guys have kind of insights into how the Topshop pack fulfillment works. Um, there are two accounts that actually stores uh, the, the moments that are fulfilled in, in the Topshop packs. There's the Topshop minter, where it's just fresh moments, and there's a Topshop locker room account. When you get your packs fulfilled, I don't know if anyone noticed, the only authorizer you have is a minter. And that's because the minter holds a capability to the locker room's uh, top shot collection. So I could just take stuff from locker room's top shot collection without having locker room's authorization. Um, this is fine because we own both accounts, right? However, this doesn't work with user accounts because um, there's no standard that kind of um, expose this connection this interface. So account A could hold a capability to account B's top shot collection or uh, an NFT provider capability. But Floaty doesn't recognize that. Flowers doesn't recognize that. Gaia doesn't recognize that. So if account A goes there and see here are the NFT that you own, list one of them for sale, it doesn't see anything that's in account B, even though it has full access to account B. So we're trying to, we're hoping to leverage this linked account standard so that we can use it to show A now owns B, right? Whether A owns part of B by restricting itself or, you know, it owns the entirety of B, this is something that is a standard. This is something that we're hoping Floaty, Gaia, other marketplaces would follow so that they recognize this linkage, right? And that's the only standardized piece of, of interface that we actually need. Anything beyond that, the legal liabilities, you know, the security stuff. And everyone can do their own stuff, right? But you need that minimal layer of common interface so that you can recognize who owns what and who has access to it. Yeah, I think that does make sense to me. Oh, sorry, Austin, go ahead. No, I mean, it's it's all right. You're closer to the problem than I am. I'm just a platform over here. Uh, it's, it's My job is easy in all of this, right? Like, tell us how to read this and we'll do it. Um, Niftery and Dapper Wallet, you, you guys have the hard job. So if, if you have something to add, please add it first and I'll, I'll come in afterwards. Yeah, no, I think actually all I was going to say was it sounds like both um, kind of proposals that were laid out actually do address what you're looking for, right, Eric, where there's kind of a limited auth account um, that gets linked, right, and that can access the whole collection. And um, so, like, Floaty can act on top of those NFTs. And I'm sure, yeah, like, Austin's definitely thought through that part, right? Like, those NFTs still need to work on third-party marketplaces. The most interesting part of the proposal, I think, the I think, Gio, you and your team laid out was that these child accounts do become almost like full accounts, right? And the app can almost get out of the 
process. But if we're not getting that out of this, or like if there needs to be more development to get to there, I'm not sure what the value of taking this like more open approach is versus like a little more limited approach, at least to start. And again, as Austin said earlier, I actually like think it is very interesting to consider both versus either or in this case. Um, and we should talk a little bit about what complexities that can introduce. Um, I, I guess two people have asked for an overview of what I put out uh, over the weekend. Are we okay with spending like five minutes on that? Is that okay, Gio? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, is, uh, uh, it sounds like most everyone is familiar with the proposal that was put out. So um, yeah, I think sure. um, you know where that would be helpful. Yeah, um, so I think like we've kind of been dancing around this, um, how do we reduce complexity and um, how do we ensure, frankly, that like apps are uh, doing the right things they need to do and that they have access to the things that they need. Um, one approach is just to kind of do what we, we have in the current flip, which is, um, you know, app can only access what it needs and so it doesn't have to worry about what you do elsewhere. I think one of the big issues with that though is there's a huge malicious user risk uh, that we haven't really fully explored. And it's a pretty heavy lift for apps to have to bear that burden. They're not blockchain experts. They're not cadence experts. Um, the things that Dennis has showed me that he can figure out and do are scary. Uh, and a random app developer is not gonna know that those are considerations they have to make. So uh, the approach you know, that I, I would say is like, I don't know, 70, 80% done um, that I put out yesterday. Uh, is really to flip the relationship the other direction. Um, if I have access to a Ticketmaster account, all I need and can reasonably expect to have access to are its NFTs. I shouldn't be putting other things in there. I shouldn't be able to pollute its account because there's even like a, an, an attack vector there where I can put garbage NFTs into it. They have to top off the flow storage and then I can just delete them and take the flow back. And like, how are they going to manage that and prevent that? And if they don't prevent that, how do I, using that account, ensure that I can deposit things to it and put flow tokens in it? Like there's this dynamic of how do I actually in practice use this and how do apps have safety in using it as well? So a couple things in play uh, with, with um, my uh, kind of proposed alternative is um, the app still maintains full control of the account. Um, we, can uh, I, I, just, I don't want to spend too much time, Jerome, on, on like we can have a separate call, I guess, on this if we want to, but I don't want to like spend 30 minutes on it, uh, I guess. Um, app maintains full control. Uh, new parent has partial control. By default, new parent has full access to all NFT collections in that account. But you can do two other things. One, you can uh, provide essentially an access control list just through this like filter interface that can say these collections are in the allow list and these are in a deny list or they're all allowed, whatever you wanna do. And then the other one is a suggestion from BlueSign, which is arbitrary capability sharing. And so if you don't just wanna share a NFC collection, you can actually proxy in whatever additional capabilities you want to. You could, in theory, actually break this whole thing by sharing uh, an auth account capability to the proxy, and then you have full access to the account also, which is kind of weird. Uh, but it would, in theory, be possible. Um, so that, that's the high level is really just this is to prioritize the ease of access and ideally peace of mind for the application. They shouldn't have to worry about what I can do to their account um, because I, all I can do is withdraw NFTs. Essentially, it, it's you know, originally was named a read-only uh, child account because that's in practice what it is. You can't save, link, unlink, load. You can't you can't do anything that modifies the state of the resources stored in the account. Um, and that's the long-winded. There are questions. Happy to field them, but um, I don't want to stray too far off topic. Uh, cool. Yeah, that's um, that's that's really awesome. Um, so. I guess following from that, my my question is, so I understand that by default, I link my account, I have access to the NFTs. Um, and you already answered one of my questions was, which was, all right, well, what, a, what about non NFT related capabilities? It sounds like you could proxy that in, which is, which is really cool. Um, 
the question for me is like um, the, the cases where an application developer doesn't necessarily want, like let's say I, I, I have a, a collection inside of my app account, I link to you and I restrict your access to like the collections provider and I go to Floaty and I want to like sell that. How would, how would that limitation be, like how discoverable is that? Uh, you know, I think it, it kind of gets into what our plat like, what are we willing to ask platforms to do? Um, there are helper methods to actually just say, like, find me the provider for a capability of this type. Um, search through the entire storage account uh, that you are essentially like wrapping and tell me where this thing is stored. Um, and then you can actually access any provider through a storage path that you specify. Um, one thing that we actually ran into or one challenge was, well, you can't you can't link and you can't unlink. So how do you ensure that the provider is even actually there? So there is one scenario where you're allowed to ask for links and unlinks. It's the case where there's an NFT collection stored, but it's not linked to its provider path. So what it'll do is it'll read the um, contract level view resolver to ask for the NFT collection data view and then configure it as it's specified by its own standard. So like it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't unlink, it only tries to link. So if an app like does the wrong thing, you're kind of dead in the water. I think that's the main risk that I was, see was seeing with it. Like you can't, at some point we have to promise the app control or we have to promise the user control. And those two things are at odds um, sometimes. I don't know if that answers your question um, or, or not. Um, I, I think so. Um, and so in that, like in the case where I go to Floaty and um, I can't, sell, or any sort of platform, um, not to just pick on Floaty, but and and I need and the app the platform is expecting that I have access to this NFT because they see it in the account, um, and and so they present me with the ability to do something on it. Um, I guess I guess in that case it would it would panic. I, I'm just trying to think about that from the user perspective where yeah yeah it would be confusing. Yeah, it, the discoverability is certainly tougher when you don't just have blanket access, right? I think that that's just like the nature of the beast where there, there's not really a way that you, if you're adding like arbitrary rules that you can use to say you can't withdraw that, but you can withdraw this, which for what it's worth, uh, unless, I mean, it sounds like Eric, it, it's what Dapper was planning on doing, but unless they split all of their collections into other accounts, this is a risk that they're going to have to tackle. Dimension X is not withdrawable. Uh, One football is not withdrawable. Flunks are not with, like lots of collections aren't withdrawable. And so full access is going to like break a lot of stuff there. Um, for now there, you know, there's pretty easy to just add a helper method in that says can withdraw, uh, essentially, or like, is this capability accessible to me? Um, you know, I think it, it really, I don't want to speak for every other platform out there. If, if you're choosing to onboard onto whatever standard this is going to be, you're going to run into those kinds of things about like, okay, when I'm dealing with a child account in this manner, um, there is a little gotcha I'm going to have to keep in mind and I'm going to have to check for this. And I would rather myself bear that burden than like make it harder to get here in the first place. But yeah, I, I don't want to, I could be wrong on that. Uh, it's one person's opinion. So I, I think like, you know, Biard is here as another platform. I don't know what, what, what his views are, but like, it really depends on what we're willing to do um, like on the platform side as well, I guess. Cool. Um, yeah, actually, I mean, that's, that's honestly, uh, when we're comparing where that complexity is going to be, um, helper methods make sense. And, and honestly, uh, like the platform perspective is, is what I was concerned about. I feel like there's, there's probably some similarities in the platform and what someone like, you know, Blockdo would be concerned with in terms of presenting their users um, compared to the applicant concerns of an application developer. Um, so hearing that there's a willingness to, to kind of, uh, you know, work through that complexity is is helpful to hear. Um, For what it's worth, I, I think that we have to be the ones to do that because we're the ones who understand what we're talking to. Um, like some random person coming in from out of nowhere and making an iPhone app and doing all of that, like they have to learn cadence fully to like really make sure that they're doing the right things. And I, I just think it's going to burn our users if we're not careful. And so like like full control is really dangerous if if we don't kind of, go into it with their eyes open. Like, like what if way, way back in the day, it turns out that accidentally the um, like main duck fault has a provider on a child account 
and we gave full access to that account to somebody else. I mean, it'd be disastrous to be there in that in that like scenario. And so like, you know, people learn over time as they interact with new systems. But you know, basically, if we're if we're introducing the system where the app is giving out like giving away full control, they have to really understand what they're giving out, uh, or it it could be catastrophic. And not only will people not come to Flow to do this, um, but that app might die from a loss of trust uh, if if we're not careful. Which, which is partially why I'm a lot more keen on like the the app maintains control so it can keep itself safe above all else. Um, you know, it, maybe there are other ways that we can try to assure them of that or or other ways to educate them as well. Yeah, it feels like the main long-term goal this is missing potentially is the like giving over full control, which seems like in kind of both cases, we're not there yet, right? Like there's ways where the app can maintain control in the first um, approach. That's kind of what Eric talked about and um, like, I just think perhaps we keep full control as a goal and not as the next iteration of hybrid custody. For what it's worth, um, there's no reason that we can't like add some method that lets a restricted account be promoted to be like a to be fully accessible in in some capacity as well. Yes. Uh, it, it really depends on where the I think like Geo and I's different approaches is really where do the rules reside? Like who who are the rules being applied to? I think is what it sounds like. Um, like, who 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 are we defaulting to restricting, and who should never be restricted? Is what it sounds like. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so uh, you're you're exactly on on the point on, on where the rule uh, being resided, and that uh, actually makes a a difference. If the rule resides on the child account, then you are depending on the fact. Well, first of all, you're going to have an assumption that this public, this child account is safe, right? Um, and that is, as as I mentioned with the reasoning uh, earlier, it's not a hundred percent easy or trivial to determine that this this account is safe. Um, so if you place the rule on the on the parent account, which is the, the that side, you basically just completely lose the assumption that it is safe because the DAP has the potential to just say modify that contract, right? So when I explained it earlier, the sole purpose of that was to limit the legal liability of the DAP itself. It doesn't really enforce any kind of hardened security on the on the child account itself. So it just comes comes back to the purpose of that child account, right? As I mentioned way earlier, accounts are very cheap to create on Flow. So if you just create an account solely for the purpose of being, you know, a kind of a wrapper on top of a collection that stores this particular NFT, um, I would say either way would work, right? And we're not trying to to impose a pattern for anyone to use. And this discoverability piece is actually the only part, only interface part that we're we're trying to get alignment on. We would very much welcome Flo Floaty or anyone else to use their own model of restricted child account or you know DAP restricted uh, capability approach. But we need to get a line on the discoverability piece of things. And unfortunately, it's pure helper methods on chain does not um, get it done because um, you know to determine ownership. Currently, there are usually two ways of doing things, right? One, uh, it's the way that uh, we do we do it, and I assume a lot of other marketplaces do it. They aggregate events, right? They aggregate deposit events into a single view or a, a, a database of some sort, and they determine, okay, this address owns this. Another approach is you go on chain, right? You run a script. You go to you maybe you use an FD catalog or maybe you just know the script. You go to someone's collection and you do get all IDs, right? And then you know this guy owns this many NFTs. And in that scenario, helper messages help 100%. Because you can use that wrapper to say, okay, so you look here, you look for their canonical uh, collection path, you look for this other place that this helper message points to. You could even use that generic. 
collection thing that I, I did a while ago, right? That's the discoverability piece. And if it's only exposed through a helper method on chain, it works for this particular method of determining ownership. It doesn't 100% work for the case where your ownership is determined by aggregations of events, of deposit and withdrawal events. Obviously, this is not a problem that is unsolvable, right? We could emit other events to say, okay, so now these two accounts are linked, right? Or this account now contains a capability to the other account's uh, collection. So a event is emitted. Once you receive that event, you place that on another table and you establish the linkage between this account and this other account. And you join that with the actual ownership thing so that you know when you have account A, you know account A is connected to account B, so you pull everything from account A and account B. You see how it gets complex all of a sudden? And that's why we kind of hoping for this discoverability piece to be a somewhat simple interface. Uh, I'm not saying like we are against this restricted account idea. I think it's it's really great. We actually proposed it our, ourselves internally and then talked about it as well, something similar. Um, so it's I would really like to hear everyone else's ideas on how to kind of cope between this kind of discoverability interface and these various models of, of account restriction because hybrid custody by itself has its kind of usage, right? This child account, parent account linking, just, you know, without any restriction that has its usage, right? Like say for mobile onboarding where we don't really want to get them to go back and forth, et cetera. So every single approach has their own kind of use case, right? But what we are trying to get like a full consensus on is how to properly kind of get a interface for discoverability and how can we help our DAP developers to pick the approach that is most suitable for them without having them to hire a lawyer and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's, that's really what we, we need. Um, so um, just to make sure uh, we've captured it. So it sounds like which, whichever route we choose, uh, we also need to consider how we represent that delegated ownership, not just in terms of on-chain, but also in terms of like the events that are emitted so that uh, so that anyone following along on the events would be able to, to, to draw those edges between a uh, user's account, primary account, and NFTs, whether they're actually in the primary account or any of the linked accounts. Yes, and ideally we limit the number of kinds of events that you need to listen to to establish this sort of connection relationship. Otherwise, you know, Dapper or Floaty or you know Gaia or other marketplaces are going to have to listen to you know the bazillion different events that indicates this kind of linkage, and some of them are different from each other. I think the part, oh, sorry, actually, go ahead, Dennis. Uh, I have one question, Eric. Like now, for example, I have TopShot account, a uh, little bit idle lately, but for example, if I go to full of scan, put my address there, I can see all my history of what I bought, what I sold, or like what I did, which packs I opened, which NFTs I got. In the new system, I will lose this ability, right? That goes back to the discoverability piece, right? It's not just marketplaces that need to coordinate and collaborate on this. The the on-chain stat aggregations, crypto slam, right? Flow scan. We all need to work together to accept a discoverability interface so that they can get a better way of aggregating this information. Okay, but then like for example, if it is like this, what is the point of creating account for the user? Like then like why not like store collection of the users? in some your accounts then like when user gets this move it to his account like then linking is like making not sense a little bit yeah, because so, like, like taking yourself out of the equation and like giving the account like i will have like 20 accounts but th these 20 accounts if every dep does uh, does like to you then i had don't have any <laughs> use for these accounts like then i can move them to my main account 
because with this favorability, everybody will ha have access to these accounts on my uh, main account. Uh, and this other account is like kind of useless, only used for storage or something like this. Like yep. we are like inventing Ethereum, uh, like some kind of uh, this dictionary. So as, as I mentioned, this kind of child account direct linkage has its use case for like a scenario where it's mobile and you just have a on-device account or you have something that is on the DApps backend. Um, what you described technically uh, works, but actually not really with the current limitations. Right now, if you want to move a entire collection, it is extremely costly because you need to load up the whole thing and then you need to store it. So that is a limitation of flow itself. And I'm not sure when that would be addressed. So say if you have a pop shop collection of say a thousand or two thousand moments, and if you want to uproot that whole collection entirely into like a, a block to account, right? It would not work because it's going to run out of gas. So that's the first concern. Second concern is deposit and withdrawal events are emitted through the collection itself, through the, the deposit and withdrawal methods. If you uproot the entire collection, those events will not be emitted. So aggregated ownership through events would not work with that. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Anir. I think the main, so the main benefit of this approach, um, or like the approach where you're giving up full custody, seems to be, or basically that the app gets out of legal risk, right? Because now the parent account holder is the one that is actually in charge of the account. I think the I want to jump in and question that one just a little bit more because. These apps are creating accounts for people, right? They inherently have some risk from day one as soon as they create those accounts. And a pretty significant portion of those accounts will probably stay unlinked, right? There's going to be some future where, sure, we all hope that everyone goes and runs their own wallet for everything. And these app wallets kind of fade to the background. But I don't actually know if we're eliminating like regulatory risk for them because like they're going to be holding accounts for people and we'll probably say like 80 to 90 percent of people will honestly be in app only wallets for the foreseeable future yeah uh just to make sure that i understand uh the question so are you are you saying that uh, the restricting the applications access and giving the user unrestricted access that that restriction itself is not sufficient and you're like bringing into question the whether that or not sufficient i'm mostly just saying like the app has legal risk as soon as they create the account right and like for most of those accounts they're going to remain unlinked so the legal risk exists for most of their accounts um like maybe 20 percent of the accounts they get up that get um linked they you're saying we're out on the clear for and we don't have risk for anymore. But I don't think we're eliminating the risk for them with this approach of giving it to a, like a third party or like giving it to the user themselves. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, not being a lawyer myself, I, like the way that I, I understand it is like if, if they're limiting the ability to access those, uh, like those financial instruments, um, then they they should be i mean they should they definitely wouldn't be increasing their risk over what you mentioned which was the you know just by nature of creating the account um yeah it looks like um yeah a lot of others <laughs> continue yeah i mean i i don't i mean it's not you know i i don't know i can't speak to the legal side of it and you know um but when we we when we consulted the council on our side legal risk in the context of accounts is only entered into once shared custody is the case. It's not like if I create a billion accounts, they're just as far as anyone in a court or a law court would be concerned. If 
they're just asset, they're just things, software entities I created, and they may have value in them of some level, but unless someone else is using them, then they're still just mine. So there's not really any legal risk that something I created, which is still mine, is causing me a legal risk, right? Like until until some third party now comes along and actually has a level of custody over those that if I then share with them, that's how it was explained to us. It's the shared custody, which you know, and every jurisdiction would be different, not financial, not legal advice, but like this is how it was explained to us and why we ended up in the place we did, um, which is that it's the shared custody part that's a huge problem because then whatever happens in that account, regardless of whether you know or you don't know, then you could be at risk of something if they do something nefarious. That was so, so the idea was that by breaking, you know, as Deep put it, we put handcuffs on the DAP account itself to restrict it. That was the way of, you know, basically saying, yeah, you know, um, you know, there's, 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 there's a, you kind of, we, we separate ourselves from this account because now we have no longer got custody. That was the, that was the way it was explained. Um, and I, and I, you know, it, like you said, like it might be, and, and that, that, that kind of brings back one of the reasons why this was also brought up, which is like, you know, the whole walletless thing, which is like, I want to just go to game blah and play it. And I don't care. And, you know, um, it, I don't care if I, claim the the assets or whatever they get created in it and in our sense in, in the way we approached it was well we could use an account behind the scenes um you know or you could use you know you could you could try and you know park those assets somewhere and say when they claim then you're going to move those assets into an account of theirs but that's a bit more elaborate and and, and it, it also requires all of these transactions and stuff so that you have to approve and things like that so so yeah, so that was the the idea was was really it was to do more with the walletless and the mobile side of things where we're thinking What's the easiest, least, least friction way to get the a user who casually played a game, who now wants to engage with it, to actually get those assets that they played with? And, you know, there's some very interesting risks that uh, you brought up earlier, Austin, and from your conversation with Dennis about how, you know, the gas limit can be bumped and things like that. And so, so yeah, so I think, um, you know, there's definitely a lot to, to figure out, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it is definitely very tricky because I can see the, the chat, there's, 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 Challenges either way, and it's almost like it would be easier to have this explained in terms of if I'm a DAP, here's what I really want to be able to do, and then to understand the options that are available in front of you, right? And so if we if, if it would be, because we were approaching this at the very technical level, looking like here's a standard proposal, and here's what it can and can't do, and here are the challenges that we face. And, um, and yet, at the same time, it's a little bit set apart from like, what does a DAP really need to do? And, and you know, if we would be able to say like, in this case, you might want to use a restricted account, and here's why, and yada, 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 and this is how it's going to work, and here are the trade-offs. In this case, here's why you want to use a, sort of a hybrid account, and here's, and the same sort of explanation, and, you know, um, and because I think it almost sounds like there's reasons that why one might want to use one versus another, depending on what you're trying to build. Um, and, you know, and you as a developer may just want to know what the trade-offs are. You may go, okay, I'll have a restricted account, but now the trade-off is I can't be easily discovered, but... I'll, I have these workarounds for it or something. So it's, it's, it's definitely tricky, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see the sort of diversity of options that are kind of coming up here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, cool, well, I just wanna be cognizant of time. Uh, looks like we are at the hour. Um, thank you everyone uh, for really great conversation. Um, and so it's, it looks like just to sum things up, it, it looks like discoverability in whichever option we choose moving forward is gonna be a key consideration, uh, not just for you know tracking ownership, but, but, but also potentially even like transactions um, and that's gonna affect multiple parties in the ecosystem. Um, so we'll need to consider, place considerations on that. Um, it does sound like it, it was really helpful to get feedback from, um, from the platform perspective that there's a willingness to kind of engage with the complexity that might come with uh, restricting the user end. Um, so between that and taking a look at like what uh, what was proposed recently, actually I think it was just shared uh, this morning um, on what that might look like uh, restricting the user end. Um, I'll go ahead and follow up with some notes uh, async inside of the Discord. And uh, thanks everyone for your time. Take care.